What do you do when there's a distinct lack of sex in a relationship? Is it normal? Why does this happen? More importantly, does it mean the relationship is over? Is there still hope to get your sexy time back? In this episode, we speak to Dr. Romance herself to find answers to these questions. Dr. Tina B. Tassina, PhD, is a licensed psychotherapist with over 30 years experience in counseling individuals and couples. She's appeared on Oprah, Larry King Live, and ABC News in the US. The lesson begins! Welcome to Founders Connect Podcast. We help lifestyle entrepreneurs to grow their business online and create a happier marriage. Did you know that approximately 45% of marriages end up in divorce and 65% of all startups fail due to founder conflicts? Well, we're here to change that. Each week, we bring you an inspiring guest and practical tips to help you with business, relationships, and sustainable living. Now, let Let the the fun begin. begin! Hi, I'm Cindy Pham. And I'm Anthony Chansomuth. And we're from Founders Founders Connect. Connect. So we are all about helping entrepreneur couples to grow their businesses online and to develop happy and healthy relationships. And that's why today we have Tina B. Tessina, PhD. I like the PhD, uh, who is a licensed (laughs) psychotherapist. It's expensive, that PhD. (laughs) (laughs) So Tina is a licensed psychotherapist in Southern California. Um, yes. Since 1978, my gosh, it's a year before I was born, Tina. Um, <laughs> with over 35 years experience in counseling individuals and couples, an author of 14 books in 17 languages, including Dr. Romance's Guide to Finding Love Today. He ends with you, grow up and out of dysfunction. 10 smartest decisions a woman can make after 40. Love styles, how to celebrate your differences. The real fairness step, my gosh, love these titles. How to be happy partners, working it out together and how to be a couple and still be free. Wow. She writes a Dr. Romance blog and the happiness tips from Tina in my newsletter. Okay. So welcome to the show, Tina. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Oh, it was uh, when I came across your profile on LinkedIn, I thought this is the person we need to be chatting to. (laughs) What's today's topic, Cindy? How do you solve shaky marriages and lousy sex life? Wow. Are you interested? I'm definitely interested. (laughs) Um, Okay. Now, before we jump into the relationship stuff, we always like to know a little bit about our guests. So, uh, Cindy. On a scale of one to 10, how weird are you? I'd say about eight. Eight. And why? Because, first of all, I'm completely self-employed. I've been married for 37 years to an equally weird guy, and we have a great fun life. I just got back from 60 days on a cruise ship. How weird is that? That's extremely weird. (laughs) But we love it. (laughs) Uh, Amazing. Okay, so obviously having been married for so long, you would have a ton of experience, personal experience going through the journey of running your own business and also navigating the relationship aspect of that. If you had all the time and money in the world, what would you do? Would you be spending 60 days on a cruise ship? Yeah, probably more than 60. (laughs) And I would build an indoor swimming pool. I love it. So you're a strong swimmer, I suppose. I love to swim, yes. But I have to go to the gym to do it. So it'd be nice if it was right out the back door here. That would be wonderful. (laughs) That's my dream too. Um, I'm not a strong swimmer, but I do love the water. So what is your favorite quote, Tina? It's never too late to be who you might have been. Breathe that in for a second. (laughs) Throughout your long career, who's been your greatest mentor, whether it's in life or career, and what did you learn from them, Tina? My greatest mentor was Denton Roberts, who is no longer with us, to my great sadness. But he taught me how to be a therapist. He took me back from suicide to help me create a great life a long time ago and very important person in my life. Amazing. Amazing. How important is it to have someone like that when you are in your darkest moments? It's incredibly important. Yeah. It's really, you know, why we created this podcast and why we Uh built because we've been through our challenges. I won't go into my whole story because people can look that up online, but certainly without specific individuals in my life, good chance that I might not even be here. So uh, I can relate to that. So thank you. There's a phrase for that. It's called the enlightened witness. Mm. Wow. The enlightened witness is the person you find who tells you 
especially when you're young. It's not going to be like this forever. You can do it. You can change your life. That's the enlightened witness. And once somebody gets that information, they're going to be okay. And uh, those who are listening have just gotten from you. So thank you for sharing that. (laughs) Exactly. How did you get into counseling? Well, exactly. As I said, through my own problems, I had a lot of grief, a lot of difficulty, and I was floundering, drowning. And I found counseling. I found somebody who could help me. And that's where Denton came in. And he helped me turn my life around. And then he taught me how to be a counselor. And what's one or two of your favorite client situations that you're really proud of, you know, having worked with a lot of people and in this sphere, or are there any that really stand out to you as, you know, because of you, you've been able to make a great impact on certain people? Well, there have been a lot in 40 years of counseling, an awful lot, but I like it when I get a client who doesn't believe in themselves, doesn't think they're worth anything, and I can help them see that they are worth something and take the reins on their life and start to direct it. I just was working with somebody yesterday who's really having breakthroughs now. It's just a great thing to be a part of. So powerful. And do you still receive letters or emails or phone calls from past clients? Sometimes. Usually I think no news is good news. (laughs) (laughs) I hear from them when there's something wrong. But at that point, I always hear that they're doing way better than they were when they first saw me. But there's this little problem. You know, somebody they care about died and they've got to deal with the grief or their relationship has a problem or something. But I can see from talking with them and spending time with them that they're doing so much better than they were when I first saw them. And that's it. It's really about progress, right? It's not about having the ultimate life necessarily. Yeah, we're always works in progress. We're always learning. I mean, I'm going to be 75 in January. I'm still learning. I'm learning Spanish for one thing, and I'm oh, learning, wow. and I learn. <laughs> Why Spanish? Because I live in Southern California. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> and I love South America and Mexico. Go there a lot, so I speak it a lot. Oh, I see. So, how do we solve our shaky marriage? Let's start with that one first, huh? Okay. You have to communicate. That's the basic thing you have to do. You have to learn how to listen to each other. I always say the three most important words in a relationship are tell me more. Mm. Mm. So if your partner is trying to tell you something, you just keep listening until they say all of it. Then you'll get your chance to say all of it. But if you keep arguing and defending and interrupting each other, then everything feels shaky. So when people sort of come to you, I guess I'm always curious about how people get into a situation where it is shaky. Like what are some sort of patterns that you observe? I mean, you've identified communication is a key skill that's Uh required, but how do people get married and not know that communication is a problem for them? (laughs) Because they're so busy having sex, they're not communicating. I mean, sex is a form of communication, but If you don't have the verbal communication too, you know, in the beginning, it's very easy when you find somebody and there's a spark. It's all about that for a while. But then that doesn't last forever, that spark. And you have to learn how to rekindle it and rebuild it all the time. And that's where the communication comes in. Intimacy is built through communication. So then you have to learn when people are in love, that's a very emotional thing. You feel very vulnerable. And you get overwhelmed easily if something goes wrong. Oh, my God, my life is over. You know, (laughs) he's mad at me. My life is over. Or she's mad at me. My life is over. And they sort of collapse. And they're afraid to come forward and find out what's going on. You know, why are you angry? My husband lost a friend of 50 years the other day. And what he does, I've learned over the years, what he does when he grieves is, and he's a very loving, caring, happy guy. But when he grieves, he gets angry. That's his first reaction to losing somebody is getting angry. And it's so unlike how he is all the rest of the time. It's very disconcerting. So I have learned, you know, to just stay calm and keep saying to him, you know, tell me what's going on. Tell me how you feel. Tell me what's up. And when he can get to the point where he can let his tears out about the grief, then we're okay. Then we're back to communicate in our usual way. But you just have to give somebody the space to deal with what they're dealing with and tell you about it. That's really fascinating. I learned a while back that oftentimes 
what's buried beneath anger is grief, is sadness. Yeah. Uh huh. Sadness and fear. Those are the two things that we use anger to cover up, especially men. Yes. Women are more likely to use tears, but men anger every time because that's the only option you were given. So you are listening to the Founders Connect podcast, helping lifestyle entrepreneurs to grow their business online and create a happier marriage. Now back to the show. All right. Now we kind of jumped in sort of halfway down the pool. Uh, <laughs> I, I, want, I want to take it back for those who are listening to this. What are the telltale signs that you are in a shaky marriage? You're not talking, mm. not having sex. Or you're having less sex than you were before. I don't mean you're not having sex every single day because that isn't sustainable after a while. You have to do the chores and go to work and do things like that. But a reasonable amount of sex, a couple times a week maybe, should be happening. It should be fairly easy and it should be fun. Mm -hmm. And if that's not going on, then that's like the early warning sign that there's a problem. And the other thing is that you can't solve anything. Instead of figuring out what'll work, you start focusing on who's right or who's wrong. Yeah. That's fatal in a relationship because you can do that forever. You can do that for months and years, who's right and who's wrong and never get anywhere. But if you start focusing on what works, what will work, what will solve this, what can we do? What do you want? What do I want? What can we do together? Then the gears start to move again, it gets you out of the rut. So are there specific tools or practices that you've seen work for people in terms of having an ongoing reminder of what works? Because I see when we get into problem mode and when there are you know, challenges that present, it's easy to go down, oh, you know, it's your fault, it's my fault, things like <laughs> and You go down there and you think everything's wrong, right? But like you mm -hmm. said, it's really not the case. It's just, you know, you've hit a sort of bump in the road, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, but 90 something percent of your marriage is wonderful. You're just not seeing it in that point in time. That's right. We're hardwired to look at the problems. Hmm. There's wiring in your brain that says, if there's any problem, focus on that. But what happens is we wind up not looking at all the good things. So there's a couple of things I teach. Do you want me to tell you those? Sure. Yes. One is time out. You make the T sign with your hands like they do in basketball games. <laughs> okay. Okay, and that's, you make a prearranged agreement that if anybody does that, all conversation stops right then. Because you do that when things are getting heated and things are going off the rails. So you do that, and the other person might keep saying things for a few minutes, but they'll settle down after a bit. And that stops, and you take a few minutes, 10, 15 minutes to calm down, get rid of all that adrenaline that you worked up while you were fighting. And then you come back to the problem. The person who made the T sign, made the timeout sign, it's that person's responsibility to bring the question up again. Mm. And when you bring it up again, you try to focus on what will solve it instead of who's right and who's wrong. Because if you say, you know, you hurt my feelings and you always hurt my feelings and you don't care about me and da 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 And if you say back, okay, so what can we do about that? How can we fix that? It's going to derail me from my anger and everything else and get me back to, oh my goodness, this guy loves me and I love this guy. And, you know, we need to solve this. We don't need to fight about it. We need to solve it. So the timeout is very effective, especially with couples who are very volatile, very reactive to each other. So if you go off quickly into yelling and arguing and calling each other names or whatever you're doing, the timeout signal is very good. Well, and, the really that <laughs> and the second really good thing is the tell me more thing. Yeah. All right. I hear you're unhappy. I'm not exactly understanding what you're unhappy about. Will you tell me more about it? And then you get to understand what the problem is. If your partner has a problem, you automatically have a problem. You know, if you're in a relationship with somebody, one of you has a problem, you both have a problem. And you need to solve it. You need to do something about it. But you can't do something about it if you don't understand what it is. So first, seek to understand. Mm. And then I like to say, once you understand what the problem is, then you can get silly. Then you can say, well, you know, if I had a magic wand, I'd just bop you in the head with it and that would solve the problem. Or maybe we could live in separate houses on separate planets and then we wouldn't have this problem or whatever it is and just lighten the atmosphere up a little bit. And then you will be able to think more clearly 
and actually work on what would really solve the problem. And then at some point you say, what would you like me to do? What would you like to have happen? You can find out what your partner wants you to do without committing to doing it. If your partner says, I want you to jump off a bridge, well, you're not going to do that, but at least you know what he wants, right? Right. There you go. (laughs) So it doesn't hurt you to find out what's going on with your partner. It's not going to hurt you. Only what you decide will hurt you. You know, we can only really hurt ourselves short of being physically hit or something. Emotionally, we can only really hurt ourselves. The other person can't hurt us unless we decide to let that hurt us. So we're safe. If I'm in charge of myself and I'm taking good care of me, then I'm safe from your emotions. I can listen to your emotions and they're not going to harm me. Mm, That's a really powerful point. Could you talk a little bit more about this statement you made here, which is that I'm responsible, well, I'm paraphrasing, but it's this sense of that you allow the other person to hurt you. That's right. right. So there's a personal responsibility there. You know, oftentimes we try and change our partners or whatever it may be. So I'm sure you've come across that many times. Uh, yeah, yeah, all the time. I have people come in, couples come in, and one of them will say, fix my partner <laughs> to me. You know, and I'll say, what would change if I did that? Mm. What kind of a fix would you like here? And then I'll tell the person who asked me to fix their partner what they need to change in order to change that dynamic between them. Mm. That's a smarter way, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's the only thing you have any control over. You don't have any control over changing somebody else. You only have control over how you connect with them. And if it turns out to be a really bad guy or somebody who's really out of control with addiction or something like that, you may have to disconnect from them to take care of yourself because they're so out of control, they can't do anything. But most people who don't have those problems Once you give them a little space and you start letting them be who they are and you be who you are, things work out. I mean, you met each other and you fell in love in the first place because you liked who you were. And then you started to change each other, try to change each other, and things got not so fun, right? (laughs) You have to go back to, oh, okay, I really do like you the way you are. And I don't have to do it with you. I don't have to be you to be with you. I can be me and do my thing and you can be you and do your thing. And then we do some things together. You know what a Venn diagram is with overlapping circles? Mm -hmm. Where every relationship is a Venn diagram. I have my circle, you have your circle, and where they overlap is where we connect easily. And the rest of the places, we have to leave a little space for each other. Space is important. That's why I wrote How to Be a Couple and Still Be Free. Exactly. (laughs) The biggest tip is that, your biggest tip for that novel? How to do that? Yeah. (laughs) I'm definitely interested in reading that book. What's sort of the core essence of the message in there? You know, like what for our listeners? Because I've heard that before. It's like, how can I be in a relationship and be myself? How can I be free if I'm committing to be with another person? So what are some practical things our listeners can do to ensure that they still have that sense of freedom? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you're committing to share with another person. You're not committing to become everything they want. And they're not committing to become everything you want, or at least they shouldn't be. You shouldn't be doing that. You should be committing to share with somebody. And there needs to be space. There needs to be enough room so that the things that we don't both like, we get a chance to do Mm. separately. And you can eat different kinds of food together, and you can have different sleep schedules, and you can have different kinds of work and all that stuff, and you can still enjoy each other's company and work out things that you need to work out. And you can like different things and dislike different things. And if you don't make a big deal out of it, it becomes not a big deal. So I wanted to go back to the lousy sex. How can you improve that? Okay. Sex is communication. (laughs) Sex is communication. Okay. If you improve your intimacy, you will improve your sex. You are listening to the Founders Connect podcast, helping lifestyle entrepreneurs to grow their business online and create a happier marriage. Now back to the show. In that case, so if you improve your intimacy, what's the best tip for that from you, Tina? Be open to change. Mm, Because if you're going to be together for any kind of length of time, your sex life is going to change. You two are each going to change because that's what 
we do during life. We change. I can't even recognize the person I was 30 years ago. Yeah. So your sex life, you know, that's part of that Venn diagram, the connection part. As you change, it's going to have to change too. So you have to learn how to talk about it. I mean, it's not so scary. You can talk about, I like this. I don't like that. I want to touch you this way. I want you to talk to me that way. I want you to, you know, whatever it is. I want sex five times a week. Well, I only want sex two times a week. Okay, so how do we solve that? Hmm. We can have full-blown sex twice a week, and then we can do something else, masturbation or something, to make up the difference between the one who wants more and the one who wants less. And it's still better, even if it's not everything you always dreamed of when you were a teenager or something. It's still a lot better to have a partner you can have sex with twice a week than no partner, right? You're going to have no sex if you have no partner. (laughs) So you have to learn to count your blessings and understand what's possible and what's not possible. There's a reality of sex and a fantasy of sex. And we see a whole lot of the fantasy of sex. It's all over movies and videos and TV and whatever, (laughs) from the sublime to the really scary kinds of stuff. It's all out there, but it's all fantasy. The reality is what feels good to me and what feels good to you. And what of what feels good to you am I willing to do? And of what feels good to me are you willing to do? And that's going to be different for every couple on the planet. Mm -hmm. The only way to make it work is to work it out together. That's why I wrote How to Be Happy Partners, Working It Out Together, because that's how you have to do it. You have to figure not what is sex like, but what is our sex like. And our sex is going to be different than the sex you had with any other partner you've ever had, because I'm a different partner. Mm. So the only way to do it is to work it out and to talk about it. And if you go for sex therapy, that's what they do. They teach you how to talk about it, how to say I like it when you touch me this way. I don't like it when you touch me that way. I want you to talk to me. You know, people are visual, audio, tactile, all those different things. And some people like having you talk dirty to them. And some people can't stand that. (laughs) You know, and if you get two of those together, then they have stuff to work out. So maybe one wears a set of headphones while you're having sex. I don't know. You have to work it out. You get creative. (laughs) That's right. You get creative. And sex is very creative. Good sex is very creative. And it's also lots of fun. And if you're in a sexual relationship for a long time, like 37 years, Mm -hmm. you really develop a sense of humor about it. You spend most of your sexual time giggling and laughing. I love that. Because that's what happens to passion in a long-term relationship. You can't do that passion thing for too long. It's exhausting. Mm -hmm. But when you can giggle together and laugh together and and silly things happen, I'll tell you what happened this morning. This morning, I was having this dream, which I've never had before. Very, very realistic dream that Richard was kissing me. I was lying on my back. He was over me and kissing me. Then I woke up and he was suddenly gone. And so I flung out my arm to find out where he was, and I whacked him really hard, and he was asleep, and I woke him up, and then I got all cuddly with him, he he had no idea what was happening, and I wasn't being very coherent either, because I was still partly asleep. We must have laughed about that for an hour after we sorted it all out, but I mean, you can't predict that. You can't say that's going to happen. (laughs) <laughs> you can't know in advance how to handle that. You just have to work it out. And, you know, he knows I love him and I know he loves me. And he knows that if I flung my arm out in sleep, it wasn't to hurt him. Even if it did, it didn't really hurt him. It startled him. Sorry. You know, I went like this and he <laughs> kind of was jolted awake. But being able to laugh about it and being able to say funny things to each other, that's the greatest reward there is right there. Any more questions on that one, Cindy? Oh, that was good. I like it. I'm sure the <laughs> listeners would have learned a lot there as well. <laughs> so I do have a question about that. You talk about the secret to great sex and an enduring relationship is intimacy. Um, mm-hmm. Having those conversations about you know, your sex life and also mm-hmm. relationships. So do you suggest having those conversations in the bedroom or is it better to have them outside of the bedroom? 
I would have them anywhere. I'd have them in the car. I'd have them in the bed. I'd have them anywhere in the kitchen while you're washing dishes. Some things, you know, it's easier to say if you're not totally focused on each other. Yeah. When I have couples who can't talk to each other, sometimes I suggest that they email or text each other. Mm. I really prefer email because texting's too fast. You can send a text before you think about it. Email's a little slower. You can get everything out that you want to say. Read it over and make sure it's what you want to say and not too dramatic or whatever, and then send it. And then you don't have to deal with your partner's initial reaction. (laughs) Your partner can read it and go, "Ah," you know, and then calm down and read it again and think about it and then respond thoughtfully. And you learn how to be less reactive and more thoughtful in communicating with each other that way. If you can't do it, Some people just can't talk to each other face to face without freaking out because that's what they learned when they were four and they have to relearn, they have to retrain themselves. So I'd say talk about it anywhere you can talk about it as long as the communication is productive, as long as you're getting somewhere. You know, when Richard and I first got together, and this is ancient history since we've been married 37 years, we would have sex and I would cry. And that really upset him. He thought he was doing something wrong. And I had to tell him, no, it's just that I've had a lot of issues in my life. And this is wonderful and makes me sad that I didn't have it before. And I'm crying from relief and I'm crying from all kinds of things. But it's not because I don't like what we did. It's because it opened me up. And that's what was in there was all this sadness. So (laughs) then he got so if I cried about anything, he'd say, are you trying to turn me on? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Talking about that, what's the moment you know that your partner was the one for you for life that you wanted? Because it was easy to see. We were married seven months after we met. Oh, okay. Because everything worked. I mean, we could just do stuff together. We could get stuff done. We could have a good time. We could talk stuff out. It wasn't all perfect. I mean, we had some fights in the beginning and stuff, but you could just see that this works. This is not only wonderful on a sexual level, but it really works in real life. We both had our own businesses and, you know, we had a lot to do and we got everything done. At one point, Shortly after we started dating, I had to say to him, look, I have to just kind of calm down with this because my business is falling apart. I'm (laughs) spending so much time with you. My business is falling apart. And he said, that's what's happening to me, too. And I'm not getting the laundry done and I'm not whatever, (laughs) because we're just at each other all the time, you know. So then we had to talk about that. How are we going to do that? And we limited our time together. First of all, we lived 30 miles apart when we first met, so that wasn't easy either. So we had to limit our time together to like three or four days a week so we could get stuff done. And then eventually I moved in to this house, which he had just bought when he met me. And we spent our whole courtship fixing up this terrible fixer-upper house. This house is more than 100 years old, and it was awful. It was in awful shape, but that's what he could afford. And that was a great way to learn that we can build a life together. Mm. So I say, if it works, if you can do real life stuff together, you know, then that's a really good sign. If you can have fun together, get stuff done together and talk about it when something's not working, you got everything you need to have a good life together forever. There you go. Another great tip there. (laughs) Let's go build a house. (laughs) (laughs) well you can just paint a room or something you know you don't have to do the whole damn thing that's challenging i can see that one oh my it's been such a valuable conversation with you tina thank you for sharing your stories as well as your it's been fun um we're gonna just wrap up now with a couple of questions cindy Mm -hmm. so what's one book or resource that's really mentioned that's made a significant impact on your life or business? My mentor wrote a book called Able and Equal. I don't think it's even available anymore, but that was very valuable to me. What was the key message from that book or key takeaway for you? That everybody's equal. If we learn to treat ourselves as equals and everybody else as equals, and we believe that we're able, we can get everything done. Mm, 
It's like learning to believe in yourself and learning to trust yourself and then other people by extension. I really resonate with that because I feel, and this taking it into you know, relationships is if we had that assumption or we had that belief and we saw our partners as equals because they are, um, mm -hmm. and that starting from the same place, we're both learning how to work in this relationship. We're both learning how to be humans in society and we all have our gifts and our flaws. It comes from a place of empathy and kindness. And I think that's a great starting place for real connection. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. It is. And if I don't value you, then by extension, I'm not going to value me. Mm. So, you know, we're all in the same boat here. And if we're not starting from a place of, you know, we both have the same rights and abilities and whatever. I mean, you might be a better singer than I am or whatever, but as human beings, you know, we're all equally valuable and equally useful to life. So start from that premise and things go better. Mm. Totally agree. So after all is said and done, what do you want to be remembered for? What do I want to be remembered for? Yes. Helping people have a happier life. That's what all my books are about. And that's what my counseling is about. I want to make a difference. I would like my gravestone to say she made a difference. In our lives. <laughs> well, the great news is you've already done that, Tina. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Continue doing what you're doing. I want to acknowledge you. We want to acknowledge you for sharing your gifts with us today uh, and for being just an amazing guest and for sharing your wisdom with our audience. Exactly. And also yeah. sharing a bit of yourself. Now, for those listening, the best place to contact or connect with Dr. Tasina is at uh, tinatasina.com. I'll just spell that, T-I-N-A-T-E-S-S-I-N-A.com. Also, there's a Dr. Romance blog, which is at drromance.typepad.com. Is that right, Tina? Yeah, yeah but at tinatasina.com, there's a link to my blog. Okay. There's a link to email me. All my books are on there. More than 100 free articles on there that people can read. So it's all there at tinatasina.com. It's a great reference. So we'll link to all those on our show notes here for this episode. And if you want to, I do encourage you to connect with Tina, the doctor, to learn all about all things romance and love. Thank you for your time and hit subscribe and share. And uh, we'll be seeing you all on the next episode. Thank you for the opportunity. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. So that was our interview with Dr. Tina Tessina, PhD, on how do you solve a shaky marriage and lousy sex life. Cindy, what was your key takeaway? That you have to work together with your spouse, telling them what you like and not like about your sexy life. <laughs> Communication is definitely the key. For me, I'm just amazed at how candid she was about sharing her journey, her story of her husband. And for me, the biggest takeaway was here's someone who's been married for 37 years and today is still very much all about communication, learning how to understand and better communicate and express yourself that you can't fix your partner, you can't change them. So the best thing you can do is actually work on yourself, yourself and being aware of what's going on for you and then learning how to communicate and express that to your partner, which is definitely something we've been going through and super critical for any couples in life, in business, wherever it may be. So that was my takeaway from this episode. I think it's the same as mine, dude. They're both communication. It's all communication. Exactly. Yep. And there was a one, I think one like quote where she said, I can't remember the exact quote, but the idea was basically around if I hurt you, I'm actually hurting myself. Oh, that's an extension of yourself. Yes, right? So it's about if I'm trying to change you, if we take that and look in the mirror, it's actually about you trying to change yourself through the other person, which is where we get stuck because if we assume that it's something wrong over there. Now, and Tina said this as well, obviously if you're dealing with someone who's abusive and physically beating you up and things like that, you can disconnect from them, right? But this is more about, I see oftentimes if we get into an argument or something, I might be like, what's wrong with her or him? But it's not about that. It's like, what am I doing? What can I do to actually, what's within my control that I can change? Mm, very great point there. Alrighty. Okay. Well, that's our takeaway. See you for your next episode. Are you thinking about leaving your job, taking control of your own destiny and turning your passion and experience into a side hustle? or full-time business? Well, check out our new corporate escape plan, PDF Guide.
It's free and you will learn the top 10 challenges for new entrepreneurs and what you can do to overcome them. Just head over to foundersconnect.co forward slash escape to grab the free checklist now. Yeah, do it. Are you wanting to create traffic to your website so you can sell more of your product or service? Well, you want to check out our next episode where we talk about an organic traffic strategy, the double stack technique. You don't want to miss out on that one. Thanks for tuning in and remember to live passionately, purposefully and confidently. Till next time, ciao!